What's up, YouTube? So, the Tom McDonald reaction video was a big success, at least for the size of my channel. And Mises just dropped this song called Trump 2020. So I thought I'd do another reaction video for a music video. Um, Mises is, is he's, a, he's a sick artist. I... I don't know him quite as well as I know Tom McDonald, but I have heard a bit of Mises' music, and I, I really like it. And also, I think the name Mises is cool. Um, dude's a beast. But, yeah, so he dropped the song Trump 2020, and, <laughs> I mean, I don't think he's going to hold back. I don't think he is. So, I'm, I'll, let's, let's, you know what, enough of me. Let's just get into it. I'm screaming Trump. Wow, he said, I'm screaming Trump 2020, Christ 21, the way shit's feeling, it feels like Armageddon's about to come or something like that, and man, you know, am, am I the only person that feels like the, the struggle, the battle that we're in right now is sort of a biblical battle of good and evil? It really does feel that way, and so he is he has picked up on that and struck that chord right from the beginning. Since you want to talk about a wall, let's talk about it. Barack and uh, Hillary were all about it. Everybody's been all about it. I mean, every administration since Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, uh, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton was on board with it for a while. The only reason that they hate Donald Trump is, well, A, it's because he's actually doing it. And B, because of what he's doing with it. It's cutting off a lot of resources and... Um, I don't necessarily want to get into detail about this, but first of all, guns and drugs is one thing, but also the human trafficking aspect, which, you know, I'm not I'm not going to sit here and publicly make accusations that I can't back up with hard, you know, cold, hard proof. But, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that just in 2018 alone, Donald, uh, the Donald Trump administration arrested more human traffickers than six years of Barack Obama's administration combined from 2010 to 2016. So, you know, well, uh, <laughs> Trump's not the first one to talk about it, yet all of the people who wanted to have it before are now vilifying for it and calling him a racist, when I don't think it's really even... I mean, it, it is about illegal immigration to a degree, but I think it's also about the drugs and human trafficking. And they make the media and the Democrats make it 100% about immigration and not wanting brown people in America, which is an absolutely ludicrous narrative for them to paint. But they do it anyways because that's what the left do, does is they lie, they cheat, they steal, they do whatever they can to, to steal the narrative. So sounds like Mises is on to something here. Well, let's, let's let him finish here. So he said, let's talk about how Barack Obama had the kids in cages first. Yes. Yes. And not only did Barack Obama have the kids in cages first, those pictures that they put out of all the little kids with like the foil blankets and that kind of thing that looked absolutely disgusting. The media actually cropped out the timestamp on it, which showed that those that that image was from 2014 under Barack Obama and the law that actually states that you had that you can't send uh, or that you have to separate the kids because you can't have the kids detained from in, in a uh, an adult in an adult facility for more than 20 days was actually from the 1997 Flores decision which was passed under Bill Clinton so all of this stuff was set up by the Democrats Yet Trump gets into office and he's just going by the rule of law that the Democrats had placed into, into position and he gets vilified for it. That is the dishonest media at its finest. He's, say, he's saying Barack Obama can't be racist. Yet you have to realize that most of this intersectionality, most of all of this, these cries of racism... Think back to the Bush era, and I don't, I'm no fan of Bush. I'm no fan of George W. Bush. In fact, I think he, he's part of the whole establishment that I'm so glad that Donald Trump is weeding out. But if you look back then, we had pretty good racial harmony. We did not have all of this idea that 
you know, the, the whole 1619 project that America began in 1619 and was founded on slavery and, and that the, the Constitution was just a continuation and a way to enshrine slavery. And this, the whole 1619 project, which the New York Times won a Pulitzer for, has been completely derided by all historians because it falls, it falls prey to presentism. And presentism is where you take the cultural ideas of now and you, and you project them onto history and onto the past and you judge them based on where we are now. It comes with no understanding of how historically we move forward and we get better and we improve over time. But I can tell you right now that 300 years from now, the people are going to look back at how we are and they're going to say that we're animals for some reason or another. Something that we do is culturally unacceptable because that's just the way human uh, human nature works. We we continue to change, evolve, and get better. But you cannot look at the history at history through a modern lens. You're not going to get an, an an actual understanding of where we come from if you do that. So. Let's go back here a little bit. I should be rewinding each time I go forward. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think I even finished my... <laughs> I don't think I even finished what I was trying to say there. But, yeah, they, they view everything through presentism. And, and now, under Barack Obama... So we had racial harmony under George W. Bush. We didn't have all this stuff. But Barack Obama let this, this ideology, this intersectional postmodernist... Uh, informed by cultural Marxist ideology just spread throughout our culture. And he never spoke out against it. In fact, he fanned the flames of it, saying things like, well, if uh, if, if I had a son, it would look like Trayvon and, and stuff like that. You know, again, my impressions are terrible, but I do them anyways, just so you can laugh at me. Um, but anyways, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't complete that thought. You can't... You can't go to church and you, they won't let the pump blast. So there, I think he's talking about how all the churches are shut down right now through COVID. And they're also trying to take away our Second Amendment rights, which I think a, a video that I reported on earlier today talked about how there is actually now sanctuary. There's a county in Oregon that is trying to pass a 2 way sanctuary law that would allow for it, it would get rid of all gun laws, including the 1934 NFA, or at least it would not be enforced in those counties. So the National Firearms Act of 1934 is what makes it impossible to get like a suppressor for your gun or makes it so you have to pay exorbitant amount of taxes in order to get things like tanks and all other things that fall under the NFA regulations. <laughs> Candace Owens. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Mises is getting, um, he's right on top of it. Wow. I, I knew I liked Mises, but I didn't know that he was on top of the issues like this. Talking about how Hollywood doesn't say anything when kids are born into slavery. And again, I put out another video last week. I was at the Save the Children's March here in Hollywood, and it was massive. But you're right. I mean, or he's right. Um, we, we've heard of pedophilia in Hollywood for decades now, and we hear Corey Feldman has been out talking about pedophilia in Hollywood ever since he and Corey Haim were both pa basically passed around at Hollywood parties when they were children, and he says that there's threats on his life against it. So not only do they zip their mouths shut, they actually threaten to kill anybody who speaks out against the pedophilia and the sexual slavery of children. So, wow, wow, Mises is... All right, all right, props to Mises here. So tired of the truth being called conspiracy, and man, he is just hitting nail, he, he is hitting nail after nail after nail just on the head, because all you hear now, anything that you try to put out that counteracts the left-wing mainstream narrative, they call you a conspiracy theorist. And it doesn't matter whether you actually have verifiable proof that there was a conspiracy. So like Obamagate, you'll hear a lot of media today still call the Obamagate Spygate scandal. You know, the, the, whole, the whole thing where they went after Michael Flynn, where they went after um, shoot, uh, Carter Page, where they went after Paul Manafort, where they went after all of these different people, George Papadopoulos, and, and, they, and they spied on the Trump campaign. 
all of that stuff. We have all of the documentation. We have all of the proof. We have the notes from Peter Strzok saying that Joe Biden brought up using the Logan Act against Michael Flynn, which for those of you who don't really follow politics the same way that I follow politics, the Logan Act was a law passed in 1799 that basically made it illegal to falsely represent yourself as an agent of America to a foreign country. Now, absolutely zero people have ever been indicted under the Logan Act, or at least prosecute, successfully prosecuted under the Logan Act, and the law essentially became completely null and void with the, intention of the, with the invention of the telephone, in which if somebody went to uh, you know, represent themselves in a foreign country as an agent of America, all that person has to do now is pick up the phone and say, hey, is he, is he really with you guys? So we have all of these notes, and yet they still call it a conspiracy theory. Meanwhile, they spent three years pumping that Donald Trump was, a, was colluding with the Russians and that he was a Russian agent since the 1980s. Non-stop. They, they went pushing that... Um, you know, the whole Ukrainian scandal, which really was covering up Joe Biden and Hunter Biden and the rest of the Democrats kickback scandal, sending Ukrainian aid to uh, or sending sending aid billions of dollars. I think it was six point eight billions of dollars. Sorry, I can't talk. It's getting late. Six point eight billion dollars in Ukrainian aid sent to sent to Ukraine, knowing that the oligarchs were going to steal it and likely got a few million dollars kicked back under the table for their trouble. And so, you know, but of course, it was conspiracy theory when Donald Trump was talking about, um, you know, the, the, the Democrat corruption in the Ukraine. And now the whole postal justice warriors conspiracy theory there where Donald Trump is trying to steal the election through the post office or some bullshit. All the left and the media have done ever since 2016 is pump out conspiracy theories. But when we actually have proof that they have conspired in, in devious plots, they call us conspiracy theorists. They call us dangerous conspiracy theorists. There's now a, a, a House resolution to condemn QAnon because Trump won't condemn it. And they say that it's some dangerous far-right thing. It's not dangerous at all. Some of it's a little kooky, sure. But, I mean, I get exactly what Mises is talking about here. God, he is... I mean, I'm sorry I have to keep stopping at line after line, but he's giving me something to talk about every damn bar. <laughs> Oh, what did he just say there? Did he say something about the masks are part of the master plan? Uh, sometimes I have a little trouble quite telling exactly what he's saying, but let's... Yeah, I think he's saying something about the masks being part of a master plan, and wow, that is... Man, he is he is onto it. He is onto it right now. But he say all the... Oh, sorry, guys, I'm going to have to run this back. Uh, again, I'm... Having a little trouble making out everything he's saying, but I feel it's important because he's hit so many nails on the head. Make our money cashless. That's interesting. And you, you have seen, there's been a lot of stuff about this coin shortage and how they're trying to stop people from using actual cash. And if they, if they get rid of the cash like that, that means they're going to be able to track every single financial transaction you make. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if that's what Mises is talking about here. So, Mises, if you see this, drop a comment. Let me know. Um, but, man, he, he's on to it there, if that's what he's saying. <laughs> so, he's talking about his... He's talking about his Facebook posts getting deleted. Yeah, I mean, the, the the big tech censorship is absolutely real. And I think that one of the biggest things that the, they're worried about is that if Trump gets reelected, and especially, we, you know, Republicans have to take the House. Because if we don't take the House, we're not going to get Section 230 reform. And for those of you who don't know what Section 230 is, Section 230 is the, is the law that distinguishes between a platform and a publisher. And so a platform means that anybody can post on the platform and the the, com the parent company who hosts it steps back. It's like a telephone line. So a telephone would be a platform. It's a, you know, the telephone company cannot monitor or, um, or censor what you say on a telephone. But, uh, and, and so what that means is if they're a platform, say I was to defame somebody 
or I was to slander somebody, that person could only sue me. They couldn't sue, say, Facebook, you know, using the example that he says, Facebook posts get deleted. Uh, they couldn't sue Facebook for the defamation. They could only sue me for posting it. But if they are curating what does and doesn't get shown on their service, they are no longer a neutral platform, and they are now a publisher because they are picking and choosing what information goes out there. And so if they get, de they, they get viewed as a publisher, all of a sudden, any of those defamation cases, now it makes them responsible, and they can get sued for it, same as the person who is making the post. And so what the big tech companies have been doing for the past several years is they have been playing both sides. They've been, they've been acting as a publisher, but then getting the protection benefits of being a platform. And that shit has to stop because that is how they are controlling and usurping the common square where we all get together and share ideas and talk and have discussions. But, but they have taken so, so much control over that, that it is, it's, it's really abolishing our, First Amendment rights. And what we're seeing now, and I think the Demo they're doing this in cahoots with the Democrats. So they're in, and you know, this is my suspicion is that they're doing this directly in cahoots with the Democrats, is that they are outsourcing and privatizing the abolition of the Bill of Rights, the abolition of our Constitution. And so they are using private firms. And so you get all the people on the left say, oh, but it's a private company, but it's a private company. They can do what they want. You know, and, and for too long, people on the right have backed that position. But you cannot have the Democrats using their croniest connections to get rid to usurp our, the the common space, the common square, the place where we all talk. So something's got to be happened, or something's got to happen, whether it's Section Two Thirty reform or whether these social media companies become get nationalized and treated like a utility. Maybe not nationalized in ownership, but they need to be treated and regulated like a utility where everybody has the right to say whatever the hell they want. And sure, that is going to lead to some people saying a lot of things that we don't want to hear. But you know what? Don't follow those people. Train it out the swamp. What? Wait. Yes, yes, Mises, defund the media. Man, the media is behind so much of the problems that we have in this country. They, they more than anybody, fuel the, fe fuel the fa uh, flames or fan the flames of all of the racial strife that we have right now. I said, I said before in the Tom McDonald video that one of the reasons that racism is an issue is because we keep making racism an issue. If we didn't talk about it, if we didn't make a big deal about it, nobody here in America really gives a fuck. But when you have this intersectional ideology that means that we are all defined by our non-attributable aspects and are just part of monolithic groups based on those aspects, based on those qualities, we are going to have a world that views everything through a racial, sexual, or gender lens, a gendered lens. And that is absolutely going to create a sexist, racist, and um, you know, homophobic or heterophobic, whatever phobic culture that you that you want. They're going to bring that into existence by pushing all this stuff. If they just shut the fuck up about it, we wouldn't have the issues. Draw a line in the sand, time to be a man. They're attacking masculinity so you don't have the balls to stand. Yes, 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 yes. Mises, holy shit, you are woke. <laughs> wow. All right, so he's talking about how, you know, they, they call masculinity toxic now. And this is, this is of course, an offshoot from feminism. Uh, and feminism is kind of the original, it, it's, it's the OG of the intersectional dividers of our culture. Um... It's, it's, it's the original. So it goes back to the 1960s with second wave feminism. But, you know, we don't need to get into the whole history of that. But, yeah, they call masculinity toxic now. They try to, um, they try to erode any sense of stoicism that was traditionally masculine. They want men to be weak. They want men to be little crybabies because weak men are malleable. Weak men are easy to control. They're easy to manipulate. 
And, you know, they're trying to weaken us culturally. And it goes back to that whole saying that hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. And that cycle perpetuates itself. Um, it just goes round and round and round. And they seem to be trying to hyper-accelerate the, the uh, evolution of weak men. And I don't know that it will ever, you know, be, because of technology, because of the the globalist ability of that technology now brings, I don't know that we would ever be able to cycle back around to strong men creating good times again. This kind of feels like the end of the line. If we lose this battle, I'm not sure how we come back. It, it was able to go through that cycle before because most things were con were constricted to certain regions. You got people rise up. The powers just were not insurmountable. But when you're talking about a globalist effort, when you're talking about a globalist agenda, that is not a power that is surmountable if it gets put into place, if they take our guns away, if they take away all of our ability to fight. That is game the fuck over. So... Yeah, and, and that's one of the biggest things that they hate about Trump is he actually has the balls to get up there and speak directly, speak bluntly, and stand up, and they can't push him around, and they hate him for that, and we love him for it. Whoa, hold on, I gotta run that back. He said, Biden mean defeat for America, kiss uh, kiss goodbye the land of the free. That is so right. And it's not because Joe Biden is actually some, um, s some communist insurgent. He's just too weak. He's too weak to fight back against anything. He, half the time he doesn't know what fucking state he's in. But if you cannot expect a man who doesn't even know what state he's in, can't get a sentence out, to be able to stand up against all of the... Marxist rioters that are overtaking our country right now. And I mean, honestly, Biden has actually been siding with them just for political expedience. You know, it, it, his actual beliefs don't line up with them. But the fact that he is actually willing to sell out his beliefs in order to placate them for political expedience just goes to show how corrupt the man really is. And he's insipidly corrupt. Yeah, okay, that's what he said. Uh, I, I couldn't quite tell. There was a part there that I couldn't make out, but he said, first of all, that was hilarious. That if that little little girl sniffing pedo gets into position, that's hilarious line. Um, <laughs> but he, he said something about how it'll lead to socialism, and it will. And, you know, if you, you guys should really go back and watch my last episode of Revved Up. It's called A Very Un-American Revolution, where I break down the, um, the Marxist infiltration and how they use cultural Marxism to subvert and infiltrate our, cult our pillars of cultural influence. So that'd be like our media, Hollywood, um, academia, all the places that inform our culture have been infiltrated by the left. And Joe Biden, while he may not be that himself, he certainly does not have the strength to stand up to it, and it will lead to socialism, which is de facto communism. People like to say, oh, it's socialism, it's not communism. Well, if you knew what communism really was, and if you knew the history of communism, you know that communism in and of itself in its true form is a pipe dream that is never attainable. And so they use socialism, a totalitarian methodology to constrict the people and and... The idea, so the idea of communism is that there will be no government, but they have to use a totalitarian government to brainwash people into believing in this communist idea, this communist utopian vision, and the idea is to socially engineer out all the foibles of man, things like greed, things like aggression, so that we're all just these meek little meek little widgets that can actually all live together without a government. It is the absolutely most asinine. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fairy tale. It's rainbows and unicorns. I mean, communism exists somewhere on the other side of the rainbow. It's, it's fucking ridiculous. It can never be achieved. And so, socialism is the perpetual pursuit of communism. But because communism is ab actually impossible to achieve, that socialism is essentially de facto the same thing as communism in practice. 
Um, I hope that made sense. I, I, I broke it down a lot better in my in my revved up video in a very un-American revolution. But if that didn't make sense, go watch the video. You'll you'll appreciate it, I think, or you'll hate me for it. Whatever, I don't care. Nope. Nope. I mean, Mises gets it. He, he understands the point and the spirit of America. The spirit of America is that this is a place where you sink or you swim. But if you... Actually, it's really you sink or you fly. And you can fly as high as you can take yourself. Now, not all people have the same ability. But you cannot have some great equalizer without ending up with some Harrison Bergeron type... Uh, type scenario now i don't know if you know harrison bergeron it's a, it was a short story short story written by kurt vonnegut where they leveled out the playing field with everybody so if you are fast they put they put weights around your ankles so you couldn't run as fast if you were smart they'd put something in your ears that like every would periodically just scream in your ears so that you couldn't think straight um but that that's the ultimate result of any of these utopian socialist equity based movements you're always it's always about taking down the or cutting off the tall trees you're all, it's about finding a common denominator and sinking everybody to that common denominator it allows us nobody to rise up whereas you have places like capitalism where sure you're going to have inequality and inequity but you're also going to find that it's going to raise all ships if you look at if you look at how we live today even people who are poor still have access to better things than even um you know, John Rockefeller had. I mean, a homeless person on the streets today has access to better health care than John D. Rockefeller when he was the richest man in the world. And that is because people had the financial incentive to innovate. And things get better. So it raises all ships. Um, so, and, and Mises seems to understand this. He, he, he seems to really understand what America means, what it's supposed to be. And you know, one thing that's interesting, I've been I've been watching this video, and this is in New York City in front of Trump Tower, which I, is supposed to be right in the middle of Manhattan, in the middle of everything. But I have not seen a single person or car or anything. It, it looks like a lifeless city. It's it's really bizarre, and I, I've heard that New York is actually way far worse off than than most of us realize in terms of the violence and everything that's been going on there, and people fleeing the city. But wow, I mean, the city looks lifeless here in this video. Whoa, whoa, hold on. I got to run this back. Wow, if America is so shitty, why do so many people risk their lives trying to get into this place? And that is a fucking excellent point. And it's not just about, I mean, honestly, you know, you have the people from Mexico and Central America that risk their lives going across the Rio Grande. You know, we've seen people that have drowned trying to cross or they've died out in the desert and things like that, uh, which, is, which is sad and tragic. But the biggest one are the people from Cuba that are actually fleeing the um, fleeing a communist regime. So I don't have nearly as much sympathy for the people coming from Mexico and Central America because most of what they do, they're not coming here to be American. They're, they're coming here because they live in poor countries that I don't really know what their government structures are, to be honest. Um, but the, the, most of them come up here and they just try to extract from America. They, they get jobs under the table. Uh, they, they, they hoard money. They don't take on American culture, American values. They create enclaves and neighborhoods that they just kind of take over and make it like little Guatemala or little Mexico. And then they send money back home, ex extracting resources, jobs, and opportunities from Americans. Meanwhile, you have the Cubans that come over. And man, the Cubans, I got a lot of respect for because those people actually get on like rafts, like makeshift rafts, and they go across 90 miles of shark infested water to flee what is truly a tyrannical system. So they under, they get here to America and they just, I mean, they, they love everything about America because they have experienced socialism. They have experienced communism. They have experienced everything that these people that are out rioting are trying to bring forth in America today. And they have swam across shark infested waters to get away from it to get to america and so they get here and they love it 
They, they become flag-waving Americans. And yeah, I got no problem with anybody coming here from anywhere in the world, so long as you're coming here to be an American, not coming here to be a Guatemalan in America. You know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very different thing. The motivation matters. So, yeah, he's, he's got that right there. Yes, yes. If it's so bad, why do you want them here anyway? So many double standards. I'm surprised you keep them straight. I, I've, I've said this for a long time. If it wasn't for double standards, the left would have none at all. You know, it's and, and that that all goes back to Saul Alinsky and rules for radicals and how one of the one of the prime methodologies that Saul Alinsky laid out in rules for radical rules for radicals was that you always blame your political opposition for exactly what you're doing. And the first, the first edition of Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky was actually dedicated to Satan. Oh, it's also the book that Hillary Clinton wrote her college thesis on. Surprise, surprise. So he's talking, he's talking about men identifying as women, and I went down a whole rabbit hole with that on, on, on the Tom McDonald reaction, so I probably shouldn't go into that again here. Um, you, sh if you, you should go watch my Tom McDonald People So Stupid reaction, and I really go down, I, I really talk in detail a bit about the, the transgender thing. Um, but hold on, what, what did he say after that? <laughs> He speaks facts, all he gets back is opinion. Yeah, and that, you know, a lot of that has to do with the idea that he speaks the truth. But so many people on the left today, you hear them talk about your truth. Speak your truth. There is no such thing as your truth. Your truth just means your opinion. It's entirely subjective. And one of the, one of the biggest goals of the Marxist insurgency is to rewrite what, is, what truth is. And they use that by, you know, subjectivizing reality. There, there is no objective truth to the communists when they're trying to demoralize a, a nation, a state, a people, a culture. It's all about confusing the hell out of people so that they can come in through the chaos and, and just use your mind as a blank slate for them to paint their ideology on. It's, it's really, really dark and nefarious stuff. Um, so that's why I never talk about your truth or my truth because the truth is objective, not subjective. What they're talking about is just be true to yourself. That's not truth. That is just self. And there is being true to self, but that just but that's not your truth. You know, and so I've become a bit of a kind of a language uh, police because, you know, one of the things that the left does is they're always changing the definition of things. They're always shifting our cultural understanding of words. Think just think about racism. Or, 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 no, 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 yeah, yeah you can go down racism, just think about hate. Just think about hate. When I was growing up, if you, hate was a strong word. If somebody, you know, if somebody hated something, that meant they really, really hated it. But now, you can be told that you hate people just for having an opinion that is nuanced and doesn't go along with the narrative. That's hate now. So they change the language. So it still has all of the connotations of hate that we grew up with, but it doesn't mean the same thing. At least not to them. Armageddon's coming. It does feel biblical. <laughs> All right, man. I got to give two thumbs up to Mises on this one. Uh, I mean, he he went after it hard. And he seems to actually have a pretty developed understanding of what's going on in our culture. Um, it's, it's, it was actually really impressive, some of the things that he was talking about there. So, man, Mises. Mises. Hit me up. I'd love to do an interview with you. Um, 
let's uh you know I'm I'm out here I'm out here fighting for Trump and fighting for the culture and everything as well and I would love to uh you yeah, know people like you and Tom McDonald and Adam Calhoun and Upchurch and all of these other people that are out there not buying into the leftist narrative that are actually fighting back against it and pushing back against it it's super impressive and I you know I want to do what I can to promote you guys I I'm not much of a I don't have much of a following yet but you know Every little bit helps getting the message out. And so, um, yeah, Mises, if you see this, good job. Really appreciate you putting this song out. Really appreciate you doing this video. We need more people like you in music taking back the culture. So, anyways, guys, that's it for this video. If you liked it, please go ahead and hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Also, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Parlor at Ram Thorburn. And if you are interested in contributing to the channel, which would be greatly, greatly appreciated, there are links to my Subscribestar Patreon and PayPal in the description below. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day.